1990年代のカバアムラーなどギャルファッションのアイテムそういうのってさマスコミとかがさ女子高生騒ぎすぎてるからね,ね騒ぎすぎてるからこっちらんでもあるだろう So today we are going to be talking about the Gyaru subculture and the Japanese male media surveillance on them.、Um, I got interested in the subculture after this viral TikTok trend. And I'm just going to share with you what I've learned so far. So, what is a subculture? A subculture is defined as a cultural group within a larger culture, often having beliefs or interests at variance with those of the larger culture. So, the Gyaru subculture is a subset of a movement that defies traditional Japanese standards or expectations such as pale skin, black hair, and conformity. Other notable subcultures a part of this movement are the Lolita and Harajuku subcultures. Other examples outside of Japan are the punk movement, the hippie movement, and even the furry community.、Um, however, unlike these examples, the Gyaru subculture operates solely as a fashion subculture with no political motivations. And just a side note, I will not be delving into the Different subcategories within the subculture itself, as there's simply too much to talk about. So, in this video, I'll only be talking about two subcategories,、uh, which are Kogarus and Gangurus. And they were at one point the face of the subculture in the midst of the monitoring of the male media. The word Gyaru is actually a transliteration of the English word Gal. The term was introduced to Japan after the startup of an American women's jeans brand with the same name in the 70s. But that's not important. What is important is when Japan got familiar with the term. Starting from the late 80s, gossip magazines and newspapers would use gyaru as an insult to criticize and ridicule girls who would appear to be hoggish money grabbers and self entitled. Some of these terms were oyaji gyaru. Ota Jidai Gyaru and Bodycon Gyaru. Of course, most of these criticisms were coming from very vulnerable and insecure men, as a lot of these girls were simply having fun and enjoying nightlife. So, already at the beginning, we can see that Gyaru isn't used to refer to girls in a colloquial way, but instead it's used by gossip magazines to mock and poke fun at girls to their predominantly male readers. Come early 90s, the next eight girls were Kogarus, right after the Bodycon Gyarus. However, what was different now was the massive influence. That Kogaru had in the media, which then led to the huge numbers of gossip magazines, newspapers, and even the news reporting on the group. Just like how the Bodycon Gyaru referred to a common fashion trait among the group, Kogarus were named that because they were high school girls. The ko in Kogaru can either be derived from the word koko and or kodomo. So Kogaru basically means a high school girl or a young girl. Kogals, Kogarus, and Kogyarus are interchangeable and mean the same thing. Gyarus, and in this case, Kogarus, can be classified as a social type, where they can be distinguished by their age, fashion, behavior, gender, and where they hang out. At this point in time, Kogarus were not considered to be a subculture yet.、Um, for a better understanding, Kogarus were basically the first generation of Gyarus. <laughs> During the early 90s, those who were considered Kogarus were rich high school girls who attended Tokyo's private schools. What was different and noticeable by the media about Kogarus was their willful embrace of the school uniform. The school uniform was basically the main fashionable item donned by Kogarus. You could see them wearing it even after school hours had passed. Uh, wearing them to go on dates after school, hanging out at shopping malls and at Shibuya district. 
This was especially jarring as high school girls in the 80s were quick to discard their uniforms, which was the sailor suit, right after school hours. But what brought about this change? Well, nearing the late 1980s, many of the elite private schools in Tokyo made a deliberate effort to hire designers to revamp their school's uniform, making it more fashionable enough to entice incoming students to enroll into their schools. With all these efforts from the schools, it led to the school identity movement in 1987. This movement happened all across Japan where schools were now reforming their uniforms to have blazers and shorter skirts. This change helped modernize the uniforms, giving it a sophisticated look as compared to the childish and old-fashioned sailor suit which was getting un unpopular among the teen girl demographic. And so now, high school girls actually liked wearing their school uniforms, wearing it in public till late at night even. Kogarus did more than just wear their school uniforms. They were now starting to get noticed by both the media and the public for their rowdy behaviours and fashion choices. No one is exactly sure why groups of rich school girls decided to rebel and cause a stir in the public, but they did. The distinguishable traits of a kogaru were dyed hair, mostly light brown, loose socks which were then paired with black loafers, and wearing Burberry or Fendi scarves, and sometimes even Ralph Lauren white blouses. Kogarus were also infamous for hiking up their skirts into mi mini skirts. This mismatch of luxury brands with their school uniform helped set them apart from the public. Funny enough, the media were, was actually scrambling to find the origins of these trends but they couldn't trace any of them back to any media or celebrities influence. The trends were set by and grew naturally within the Kogaru subculture. However, what was not funny was the beginning of the immense media coverage of these girls. There were now TV crews finding girls who they identified as Kogarus and interviewing them and filming their clothes. The underlying tone which much of these reports and coverage had when interviewing or talking about Kogarus were very, very questionable. An example is this article which is arguably the first article on Kogarus. It was published by Spa magazine in 1993. The headline reads, the lure or temptation of the Kogaru. Do you see my point? The writer then criticised the bodycon gyarus for their tight-fitted clothes and nightlife and then praised Kogarus for their youthful image, making them <coughs> alluring to men. But more on the media reportage later. <laughs> Kogarus using their school uniform to rebel is not something new in Japan as there have been instances of schoolgirls using their school uniforms as an act of defiance. During the 60s and 70s, Sukeban girls would purposefully lengthen their skirts and cut their blouses shorter. And because they were actually gang members, they also carried weapons. But that's not our focus here. And since the majority of students who altered their uniforms were gangsters, anyone who altered theirs would be presumed to be delinquents by both the school and the public. Apart from altering their school uniforms, these groups of rebellious teenagers or literal gangsters would also dye their hair a lighter colour. These groups would be seen together behaving improperly and being rowdy in public, all of which would help distinct them from conventional society with their hair colours, altered uniform, and even their own founded community. Now, back to the early 90s. Kogarus were starting to get called rich delinquent girls, as apart from their rebellious fashion, Kogarus were also changing their manner of speech, speaking crudely and speaking phrases often spoken by gangsters or rowdy people in general. This rebellion then goes back down to convention and conformity, as Japanese society teaches and expects girls, especially rich girls, to speak in a way that reflects passiveness, innocence, and reservation. Kogarus, on the other hand, adopted slang and openly talked about sex and their feelings, which was frowned upon. They used taboo words such as manko, teman, and even masculine words such as boku instead of watashi, which was the feminine term for I. 
Other non-vulgar vo- vocabulary that Kogarus adopted was slangs used by also actual delinquents with yabai, ikemen, or maji, to name a few. This new manner of speech was criticised by the media and the, the general public for breaking social rules as speaking openly and loudly in public. On top of using masculine terms and taboo slangs, is a big no-no in a very much conservative and hierarchical country like Japan. Another narrative apart from the rebellious delinquents narrative concocted by the male media when talking about Kogarus was the selfish Gyaru narrative. Although a part of the media craze with Kogarus was simply due to the fetishization of schoolgirls by men, the other part was formed due to men's bitterness and same old misogyny. As if the media is not sexualizing these girls, you can definitely expect them to be misogynistic. Kogaru spending their time at popular hotspots instead of studying or preparing for the college entrance exams were observed and looked down upon by the media and the public. They saw these girls as materialistic for only spending their money on clothes, tamagotchi and Hello Kitty instead of studying. And this comes during a time of economic instability in Japan where the unemployment rate was steep. And so seeing these girls not wanting to contribute back to society, either through workforce or being a wife, apparently aggravated a lot of men, inciting their need to vent it out in gossip magazines. By the mid-90s, the Kogaru style was arguably the most popular fashion trend among high school girls. You could see girls wearing either loose socks or shorter skirts or dyed hair or all of the above when they were out in public during school days. Unfortunately, this increase in the visual presence of school uniforms and girls in public got many perverts to pivot their eyes away from the college girls in the 80s to minor underage high school girls. And so, with high school girls becoming an ideal type for a certain group of men, thus came in the media reportage to help satisfy their sexual appetite. During this period, Kogarus and their lifestyles were documented everywhere in magazines, even men's, TV shows and newspapers. Kogarus as a media topic was apparently very entertaining for the general public. TV shows would have segments detailing the Kogaru fashion and sometimes even get random Kogarus from different schools to compete and play games. This whole ordeal was very weird. Was very weird. And I say this because oftentimes the reporters would be grown men interviewing these young girls. They would then also crouch down to get a better look at the loose socks and even get the camera to capture that angle with a lot of zoom-ins. And just the whole thing was very bizarre. Like, who were their target audience? Just the whole thing was very questionable. Moreover, apart from the TV shows, you would have men's magazines talking about Kogarus and their fashion in between pages of racy pictures and sex services reviews. And it did not help that popular Kogaru magazines like Egg Magazine, for example, would have slogans that stated get wild and be sexy or publish articles with sexual innuendos and sexual slapstick apart from the fashion. And this open encouragement to be sexual to their underage audience who aspired to be Kogarus not only perpetuated the stereotype that Kogarus were sexual deviants, but it also gave men more justification to sexualize them. And you could see this because when scandals such as the Telekura clubs were starting to gain traction, male gossip magazines were riling up and encouraging their readers to engage with teenage girls. One post talking about the scandal in 1989 reads, The best time to pick up calls are rainy days and late at night about 11. You get quite a lot of likely ones, as you might imagine. You should chat about things in a light-hearted, cheery sort of way. The going rate is between 20 and 40,000 yen, and a present like some sort of accessory will probably go down well too. To go back to a hotel with her will cost about 30 to 50,000 yen, but housewives are satisfied with a bit less. 
If they ask for pocket money, it seems as if any amount is fine. It might just be that for readers seeking excitement, telephone clubs are a golden opportunity to play. But if, like the journalist in this magazine, you wind up meeting a middle school girl, self-restraint and self-admonishment are going to be essential. Oh wow. Oh wow. Oh wow. Oh wow. This blatant display of lustful behavior when talking about the appeal of teenage girls was very, very common in Japan. Scandals such as the Telekura Club scandal resulted in the media lumping deviancy and promiscuous high school girls with kogarus. They were basically interchangeable to the media. Yet, despite male gossip magazines lusting over kogarus and their promiscuous behavior, both the media and the public turned their judgment towards criticizing Kogarus for participating in such scandals. I mean, take for example the Buru Sera shop scandal. Buru Sera or Bloomer Sailor shops sold used school girls' sailor uniforms and sometimes their underwear to fetishists. Such an establishment had existed in the 80s, yet when a scandal involving teenagers and materials broke out in 1993, the public condemned the teenage girls instead of the perverts who consumed such materials. Also, the girls in the video were considered to be kogarus judging by their physical traits. Unsurprisingly, when the media covered the story, they used the term kogarus in their articles and scrutinized them rather than report on the fact as to why there was such an establishment in the first place. And now, the biggest controversy during the later half of the 90s was Angel Kozai or compensated dating. It was so huge and problematic that it had garnered international attention criticizing Japan for teenage prostitution. You would think there would be more outrage for the protection of minors. Um, however, a huge chunk of Japanese news reporting this scandal instead were more obsessed and even delighted over the fact that teenage girls were being sexual deviants. It was either that or the outrage that these girls were committing immoral acts. Oh, and just a disclaimer, I'm not saying that the mid-90s were the start of the sexualization of schoolgirls, as that's simply untrue. There always has been a market for perverts in Japan, but it was the accumulation of the huge relevancy of kogarus with their fashion, delinquency, as well as the as well as just them being the overall representative image of schoolgirls, all of that together exacerbated the number of reportage of schoolgirls during that time period. Apart from the media sexualizing kogarus, there was also misogyny in much of the media coverage during the later half of the 90s. Because much of the Japanese media operates through the lens of the male gaze, much of the reportage on the sexual scandals focused on the promiscuous and materialistic behavior of the girls and not the <coughs> questionable behavior of the men involved. The reports were either being sickly obsessed with the idea of girls being sexual or berating them for tainting moral society with their hoggish behavior. Hoggish because some men saw these girls as selfish and materialistic for using the salary men for his money. These um, investigative reports were borderline harassment and invasive on top of misogynistic as because tell me why were journalists tapping a schoolgirl's phone to not only listen to her conversations with the salary men but also broadcasting it on TV? Citing from Schoolgirls, Money and Rebellion in Japan, Kinsella states, When journalists paid girls to talk to them, preferably about sex, the distinctions between media research, social documentary and child solicitation became blurred. With these male-oriented media coverage having no distinct motive or educational value other than to satisfy the general male population's obsession with delinquent girls, it led to more perverted men thinking, there's just so much news and ways to get teenage prostitution and how these girls simply want to have sex for money. Maybe I can engage with a minor since it has always been a fantasy of mine. 
And that's precisely what happened. There were now more interactions from men who were expecting sexual favours from schoolgirls. And to make matters worse, much of the visual representation from the coverage of these high school girls about the scandal were Kogarus. This was of course a deliberate play from the media, I think, who had already in the past associated Kogarus with delinquency and sexual misconducts. So what was happening was when these filthy men were looking for company, they would also look for who they presumed to be Kogarus. An account from a Kogaru during the 90s recalls to the Tokyo Damage Report saying you'd get old guys who would say how much for sex. Some would hint, some would just start negotiating without any preamble. It's the damn media. They give people the idea we are down for whatever. If you had blonde hair and loose socks, everyone looked at you like you were a teenage prostitute. And the damn media did not care one bit, as they knew that covering Kogarus would also get them their desired viewership ratings. Citing from Tadashi Suzuki and Joel Best in The Emergence of Trendsetters for Fashions and Fads, it is stated how during this time, high school students had made up only 4% of the population in Japan. But these young women commanded a disproportionate share of the media and marketing spotlight. Firms were targeting them in hopes of sparking national and even national crazes. The mass coverage of high school girls that was already prevalent before Anjo Kozai was then intensified after the scandal. These girls were subjected to appearing in media where they were infantilized, sexualized, ridiculed and objectified, all of which they had no authority over the narrative that was construed of them. Kinsella also states how these teenage girls had no detectable access to the mass transmission of images of themselves and their engagement with the creation of these images was limited to posing for cameras in an improvised outdoor theatre. This gross imbalance of power between school girls and intellectual and cultural professionals constituted the invisible social relations of deviant girl subculture. And you could tell because most of these interviews were impromptu and what these cameras did was that they would film the girls from the bottom with an emphasis on their legs and miniskirts. The film crew would then blur their faces and distort their voices. And when the public watched these documentaries about the scandal, the common narrative that was pushed onto them were that were mostly sexual innuendos like loose socks equating to loose sex or the girls being lax with their sexual favors. The girls identity was solely formulated to either be a laughing stock or made a bait for misogynistic men to yammer on about girls being imprudent in addition to the sexual deviant girl storyline the girls had no autonomy over the narrative that was pushed onto them by grown men It's safe to assume that the Japanese male media basically feeds into the male's fantasy of schoolgirls. From the one too many gossip magazines that publish articles visualizing schoolgirl fantasies to rile up their readers, to the schoolgirl being a genre in corn, and to the existence of taboo establishments such as the Buru Sera shops. All of these are evidence of the hold that men have over the image of schoolgirls in the media. And with the existence of Kogarus and their perceived rebellion against the good wife and mother pathway through their carefree attitude, tan skin and vulgar behaviour, this was now seen as a threat to Japanese men. Because now, the appeal of schoolgirls, which were their childish nature or innocence, was now being challenged by Kogarus, who were infamous for their rowdy behaviour and crude manner of speech. And the icing on the cake is that Kogarus were now the face of schoolgirls during the 90s. My theory is that the male media felt a sense of loss in their power to control the schoolgirl fantasy, which may have then led to the exaggerated and disproportionate news coverage on these girls every time there was a sexual scandal. Because it was through these reports that men were then once again in control of the schoolgirl narrative and pivoting it back to their own racy fantasies. And this is reiterated in the Japanese schoolgirl figure, where Sarah Hem states, Male participation in Enjo Kozai and constant power renegotiation of the schoolgirl figure are symptomatic of the male effort to regain control of their suffering masculinity. 
This then also explains why the misogynistic reports about Angel Kozai continued to be published and dragged even further past relevance. In their struggle to maintain the narrative of deviant girls, the writers of these gossip magazines would come up with scenarios where men were where men poked fun at older women maybe having to resort to compensated dating themselves. With a headline stating, Reverse compensated dating has started among office ladies in their 30s. Other headlines included personal accounts of interacting with these thin girls under, dis- under the disguise of journalism, with a headline saying, The middle school girls I met at a dating club. I am disgusted. Another way for these men to boost their masculinity was referring to the girls who participated in compensated dating as exhibiting fatherless behavior. Gossip magazines had headlines such as To Our Daughters Who Do Compensated Dating or The Role and Responsibility of the Fathers of Ultra Dangerous Daughters. One article had this to say, It would not be surprising if some of the daughters of dads reading Sunday Mainichi were doing compensated dating. Through these articles, misogynistic men were then able to live vicariously through a fictionalized scenario of a father figure to these delinquent girls. However, the 90s was not the first time where the Japanese media were frothing at the mouth with schoolgirl deviancy, and such obsession can actually be traced back to the Meiji period. During this period, schoolgirls were occasionally subjected to public judgment of either being a bad girl or a good girl. The patriarch believed that if any girls failed to uphold their modesty and virtues, they were then to be branded as degenerate or bad girls. To be a bad girl, these girls would have had to abandon their chastity or femininity. You know, the two sole defining factors of being a woman. Of course, the definition of a bad girl was very exaggerated in most cases, as most of these bad girls simply held hands with their boyfriends in public, maybe a little bit of PDA. And because these schoolgirls were from wealthy families, the media for some reason were even more ecstatic to report on their slightest misstep in their behaviour. As expected, the scrutiny were on the girls alone and not on the school boys. The media would constantly report on scandalous stories about schoolgirls and their apparent deviancy and having failed to uphold their values and blamed them for morally corrupting society. In extreme cases, the media would actually report on girls who got pregnant and or abortions, sometimes outright naming them in their articles and setting them up for immense public hum- humiliation. And the media's obsession actually goes further as by the late Meiji period, Tales of Degenerate Schoolgirls became a series where stories of schoolgirls being bad were published for the public. And this is just one out of the many other tales of schoolgirls that became popular among the public. So much so that schoolgirl rebellion became a literary genre of its own. But more on that later. Now, we have arrived to the late 90s. The face of Garu fashion, which was the Kogaru style, subsequently dwindled out and was overshadowed in popularity by Ganguro fashion. Kogaru fashion at this point was very popular. It was not a secluded fashion trend among groups of rich girls anymore. And basically, the subculture was enjoyed and participated by lots of girls and even men alike including those of the lower middle class. And as such, came more fashion trends that were more affordable and accessible. So less luxurious items and more pink, more mini skirts, and summer-esque clothes. And soon after, the demographic for the Garu subculture consisted of more girls from the lower middle class than rich girls like it initially had. A brief summary of this shift can be quoted in Schoolgirls, Money and Rebellion in Japan, with Kinsella describing it as the personality of the style veered from that of the slatterny coquettishness of dropout schoolgirls toward that of moody punk divas. And just like their predecessors, this new generation of garus caused a moral panic in Japan. Before, the media and Japan were worried about rich girls being morally strayed, being materialistic and sexual. Now, although there was uproar for Kogaru Rebellion, it was an entirely different ballpark when it came to the public and media's reception towards Ganguro's 
and their fashion. Ganguros and their entire existence was seen as an abomination and basically anti-everything an ideal Japanese woman was to be. These girls had grown men shivering and stuttering on TV simply for dressing the way that they were. Because of their deeper ten, media reports were naming these girls with hyperbolic terms like Yamanba, Gonguro, uh, and Gongaru. This was an extreme turn of events from calling them Kogarus before um, and now to Gangurus. We had male magazines who were projectile vomiting that their poor readers couldn't fantasize about schoolgirls anymore because now the face of schoolgirls in media and pop culture were darker skinned girls with heavy makeup. Some examples of these headlines from the magazines and articles read Big Survey Aesthetic Teenage witch girls should be worried. We want to see the real faces of our black-faced daughters. Again, the role-playing of the father figure, but moving on. Cabaret clubs have become liars for those ugly witches. And my favourite, are we going to have even more of these witch and black-faced porno videos? Although we may think that the reception towards Ganguros seemed exaggerated, to Japanese society at that time, their anger seemed warranted. As this issue of darkening one's skin was opposing the Japanese national ideology of homogeneity and race purity, which was pale white skin. The way skin colour goes about in Japan is that it's identified as either white skin or black skin, with no in-between. So no tan, brown, dark brown, etc. White skin and black skin in the context of Ganguro and Japan differs from the meaning that Western countries are familiar with. White skin does not actually refer to Europeans as a race, nor does black skin for Africans. It's more of a colorist issue stemming from classism in Japan. But they are not mutually exclusive, as this idea of white skin being ideal and favoured does trickle down to racism when it is used to discriminate and oppress not only black people, but others with darker skin in modern Japanese society. But back to the context. In disciplining the Japanese body, gender, power and skin colour in Japan, Angelaka states, Whiteness also represents beauty nationalism, symbolizing traditional Japanese-ness because the Japanese believe that they constitute a single race with a common skin tone. Later on, she states, Bihaku girls classify their whiteness as a symbol of traditional femininity, nobility, conservatism, good middle or urban wealthy class, while dark skin signified working class, lower economic status or rural women. Bihaku means beautiful white skin and it was basically a status Japanese women strived to achieve. Japanese women, mostly those who are rich, strive to achieve that status in order to be seen as attractive by men, thus increasing their marriage prospects and hence valued by society. Soon after, middle class women and even lower class women started prioritizing pale skin as they saw it as a step closer to nobility and womanhood. Fun fact, the Japanese actually viewed their white skin as superior to Europeans' fair skin as well as other pale Asians. And this was pretty much emphasized in their nationalism during a certain period. But back to Gangurus. Characteristics of personality traits such as poise, pureness and sensibility were linked to white skin, whereas traits such as barbarism and being uncultured were associated with black skin. However, simply having white skin is not enough to be praised by society. Hitomai, which roughly translates to the presence of other people or where you are in public or in front of others, is a very important concept in Japan, where presenting yourself in a proper manner is to be considerate of others. Citing from Angelaka again, she states, A good appearance signifies social manners and responsibility, since it's regarded impolite for a woman to present herself without having taken care of her appearance and makeup. So basically, if you are perceived to have a bad appearance, you are essentially being disrespectful to others and lack manners. With our new founded knowledge in mind, you can then better understand the reception of horror towards Gangurus. So basically, black skin means ugly, lower class, and because it's ugly, you are actually being inconsiderate to others by being in public, looking like that. Through this 
appalling appearance of the next wave of Gyarus, the media then decided to name these girls as Gangurus. Ganguro roughly translates to blackface, and because having dark skin is undesirable and un-Japanese, these girls were subjected to both the public and the media mocking, vilifying and degrading these girls for their fashion and makeup. The media saw Gangurus as the personification of everything immoral in Japanese society. From their dark tan, revealing clothes, boisterous loud personality to their promiscuous behaviour. And such repulsiveness for the subculture was blatantly perpetuated to the public. These girls had the media call them unhygienic, idiots, loud and hideous. All of which ties back down to the prejudice against black skin. Unlike Kogarus whose sexual behaviours were somewhat enjoyed and desired by the salary men, the same group of perverted men rejected the same provocative advances from Gangurus. In some cases, even resorting to violence and assaulting these teenage girls. And it only got worse. Although the reception of horror started from the initial ideology of white skin purity, media reports started to relate their insults to black people and were very, very blatant in their racism against Africans. On top of the misogyny. Some examples of these headlines were, is it the influence of global warming, evolution or a passing trend? Probing the Latinization of Japanese youth. Or which girls in monster makeup? And, like all the animals walking on the continent of Africa, they have their own. Just like giraffes and ostriches, Shibuya is a safari. You are the Japanese G-word. Of course, men's magazines were not the only ones criticizing these girls, as women did it too. A female writer who, works, who worked for Kogaru magazines was quoted in an interview in 1997 stating how Gangurus were like primitive people who don't use words or language or books. People who just exist by means of images, their appearances and their body adornment. If they want something, they just take it. They are material animals, they are not interested in culture or society. They are only interested in money. Of course, despite the changes of phys- in physical traits, Gyarus still get associated with materialism, just now with the addition of racism. But something positive to talk about, some would argue that the reason for such an extreme shift from the style of Kogarus to Gangurus stemmed from the desire to oppose everything that was sexualized by the media. When the Kogaru subculture was at its peak, the male-dominated media were privy to their every move, even sexualizing their uniforms, behavior, and scandals. It was common for journalists to easily invade the circle and report on what's trendy or not for their male readers. This was easily done because Kogarus as a subculture was relatively new and they were still palatable for the general male population with their school uniforms and their assumed sexual deviancy. However, that changed when Gangurus darkened their tan, war heavy, almost comical makeup and shifting from the uniforms to bright coloured clothes. Whether it was intentional or not, this move repelled and frightened any outsiders from the circle, and media outlets only reported from a distance. In Ganguro in Japanese youth culture, self-identity and cultural conflict, Liu quotes from an observation from Kate Klippenstein, stating how Ganguro girls have made their own choice to not follow the pack, but instead, they have chosen a carefree and open approach to living for the moment and escaping from being ignored or neglected at home and isolated, bullied, or depressed at school. And you could see such influences from popular Gyaru magazines who motivated their readers to embrace their youth, be energetic, and to not be restrained by the rules. So maybe this shift was a deliberate choice, but we do not know for sure. What we do know, however, was that girls were having fun. They were participating in trends for themselves and other Gyarus alike. And even though their rebellion may not be intentional, Gyarus having fun within their subculture was enough to resist conformity and rebel against societal norms. Now let's move on to a more interesting topic, the fashion. First, the physical traits. Even though Kogarus had lighter hair shades, Gangurus actually took it a step further to bleach their hair. They then styled their hair either straight or in a crimped style called Sujimori. Some hairstyles focused on the volume and others on length. Nails were also very essential in the second wave of the Gyaru subculture, with it growing in popularity towards the end of the decade. The nails were very long in length and had various designs. 
with the most popular nail art emphasizing either on bulky ornaments or brightly coloured nails. For the face, circle lenses were very popular with the intent to enlarge one's eyes. Ganguro makeup was very exaggerated and dramatic. The term given to the eye makeup was called panda makeup as the white concealer or eyeshadow against the brown skin resembled a panda. Other makeup essentials consisted of black eyeliner and fake lashes. However, not everyone did their makeup in such an extreme way and there were other variations of the ganguro makeup. Moving on to their clothes, although some still wore their school uniforms, the general fashion for ganguros or garus in the late 90s to early 2000s now were more towards summer clothes and vibrant coloured clothes. The general trend we could see were high platform boots, mini skirts, tank tops, beach wear, Hawaiian floral prints, and simply pink. The image of Garus expanded beyond the high school girl and towards teenagers hanging out and young adults. A common misconception towards the Garus style is that from an outsider's perspective, one would assume that these girls are cosplaying a white girl from California or an African-American woman. I mean, from an outsider's perspective, the blonde hair, dark tan, and summer clothes may give that impression, but that's not the case. The initial style of having a dark tan and bleaching one's hair is in direct relation to rejecting traditional Japanese concepts of white skin and beauty. And because Japan is a homogenous country, the way they navigate issues of skin colour is a lot more different than it is done in the West. However, this is not to say that Gyaru fashion has zero inspiration from trends in America. Looking at the Gyaru subculture as a whole, the girls rebelling society through their fashion, loud personality and rowdy behaviour was unfortunately still enough to be sexualized and, and fantasized by grown men. Once again, is anybody surprised? I don't want to dwell too much on this topic because there is simply too much to dissect and I won't do it justice by summarizing it in a few, few lines. The idea of girls' rebellion against the patriarchy or rebelling in general has always been a topic of interest for the media. Take for example the deviant girls during the Meiji period. Apart from the scrutinizing media reports on them, there was also an influx of literary texts written by men about schoolgirls rebellion. The stories all portrayed a young heroine whose main identity was the was the schoolgirl. Moving on to the 90s where Kogarus were the face of rebellious schoolgirls, hating older men, playing and running away from older, vulnerable men were common characteristics in the ideal heroine in many of the uh, in many of these schoolgirl centered stories. The portrayal and stories of schoolgirls have long existed before the time of Kogarus, but it was with the media interest in Gyarus as well as the Angel Kozai controversy that exacerbated and solidified this particular stereotype of schoolgirls in films and novels during the late 90s. So much so that it's part of the Japanese schoolgirl figure. Scandals such as the Enjo Kozai and Telikura clubs, where teenage prostitution went unsupervised, was seen as a fantastical act of rebellion in male media culture. A lot of these male writers viewed literal predatory behavior and, it, and teenage prostitution as Girls fighting the patriarchy. Hating men was a key personality trait for these heroines and these heroines would even resort to violence and get into fights throughout the movies. Additionally, a good number of the media produced about high school girls during the late 90s and early 2000s portrayed the sexual scandals very nonchalantly, sometimes even being the actual plot and having no clear moral distinctions. These scandals were also portrayed in a way where Kogarus were assumed to be actual sexual deviants who engaged in these activities. Furthermore, what these films had in common were that the ambitions of the heroines were always in relation to a man. The heroines would say man is the enemy, assault a man or take advantage of an older man, making him pitiful, rather than simply crafting a story that reflected friendships, sisterhood. It was simply too much to ask for a story centering around schoolgirls without 
it being in relation to a man or the inclusion of the sexual scandals. Refuses. Just try a little taste. Don't just stare at it, eat it. <coughs> Fuck sake, man, you amateur. I can't, I can't. Very obviously, men had found another way, a masochistic way, but another way to fantasize about schoolgirls. And this stereotype carries on till today when a Garuk character is introduced, where the common personality traits are that she's promiscuous, lustful, etc. There really is no escape from the male gaze. It is very frustrating to be surveillanced by the media and the public, where an, where an attempt to resist conformity through your fashion is rendered useless as it becomes sexualized or tainted by the male gaze. Girls who are expected to passively accept very outdated notions were beginning to take charge in their daily lives while simultaneously having fun. What was fun was questionable in some aspects, but fun nonetheless. Yet they couldn't do so in peace without the invasion of the male-centered media. The representation and narrative construed of women, in this case schoolgirls in the media, by men was very evidently a projection of sexually starved and misogynistic men. The vulgar and promiscuous behavior of teenage girls was a sexual fantasy for men and they were basically spoon-fed such materials and patted on the head as the majority of society did not criticize their <coughs> questionable behavior and misogyny. The male media contributed to placing these groups of girls on a national stage, watching, criticizing, and even obsessing over them with no ounce of shame. They found entertainment in reporting and reading about the transgressive and morally impure girls when the irony was literally right there. Tell me, who is morally corrupting society? A guy salivating over a child or a girl picking her nose in public? And such shameless behavior is a result of the patriarchy. Much of the media consumed in the 90s and before were made by and for men. And because of that, I think the role of Japanese men in society is often bypassed or overlooked. Men are not held accountable for being literal perverts or sexual deviants. Japanese men alone led to the Japanese schoolgirl figure being a profitable concept in the media where the sexualization of adolescent girls is not a taboo. Basically, the Japanese schoolgirl figure can be sexualized and is okay unless it's actual schoolgirls being sexual themselves. All in all, the patriarchy sucks and being a woman who simply wants to exist is apparently too much to ask for without a man getting in your business. Um, that's all I have to say and I hope you like learning about the history and the fashion of the Gyaru subculture and thank you for watching.